major ble brain bleed four months ago. And I have to tell you that I've got to see the miracle working God. Because for me, my first husband, when he passed away, I thought to myself, is my second husband going to pass away? And the Lord started working with me and molding me and that I had to just come to that part of surrender. What if you take another one? What if you do that? And then you know what I thought to myself and what my soul said to myself? Blessed be the name of the Lord. You gave and you can take away. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, right now as we look into your word. Lord, women in this room that love you, they've laid down their lives to serve you. And they've married a man that serves you with his whole heart. And Heavenly Father, now as we study family, would you come alongside of us, Lord, and quicken to our hearts the things that we need to learn? And Father, would you uh, speak to us in Jesus' name? Amen. I'm going to be in Genesis chapter 25. I'm going to be studying on marriage and family, but... What I want to give you, girls, is practical application, along with verses in the Bible, but things you can do to change your marriage and to change maybe the way you are mentoring and loving your children. Maybe they'll be a little bit convicting. I know when I was studying this, I was convicted. And so... Uh, we want to lean into the Lord when he's showing us something. We want to be able to adjust. But more than that, ladies, we want to change. We want to be that vessel that's pliable and moldable. And after my husband was so sick and the Lord healed him, during that one time for me, I kept saying to myself, remain flexible. Remain flexible. Breathe in. And I want you all to do that right now and breathe out. That God is good, and he is going to take care of you. So we're going to be in Genesis chapter 25, and we're going to be studying about Isaac and Rebekah and the things that they went through. And you know what? It's going to make you feel a lot better about yourself. Seriously. This is drama on steroids, what's going on here that we're going to be reading about. You're going to come away and go, yeah, we're kind of messed up, but we're not as bad as they are. Okay, the Bible is good to point that out for us. So let's look here. Isaac was 40 years old, 25, verse 25, chapter 25, verse 20. For 40 years old, when he took Rebekah as his wife, the daughter of Bethuel, the Syrian of Panam, and the sister of Laban, the Syrian. Isaac was 40 years old when he finally got to be married. And here we're seeing that he finally gets the woman that he won. She's probably a little bit younger than him, but not too much younger. And they're advanced in age already. My um, daughter-in-law, uh, she's married to my son, who just as recently took over our church at Joshua Springs. And um, she had a baby at 40, and she told me it's no laughing matter. She goes, it's hard having a baby at 40, especially after you've got a, almost a 14-year-old and almost an 8-year-old, and then here comes baby boy, right? And so here he was waiting for that time in his life, waiting for the perfect woman that came, would come into his life, and here he's found Rebecca, and it says here in verse 21, now Isaac pleaded with the Lord. I'd like you to underline that right now, because your husband pleads with the Lord for you. If you are married to a pastor, the, your husband is pleading for you. He prays for you. And here he's pleading for his wife because something was on her heart and she couldn't have a child. He pleaded for the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his plea. How wonderful, girls, that you have a man that prays for you. Do you know all over the face of this earth there are men that would never pray for their woman? They would never serve their woman. They wouldn't care about them. And other ladies look in on your marriage, whether you know it or not, and they see how much your husband loves you. And it pricks their heart a bit because maybe they're not married to someone as kind as your pastor husband who really does care about you. And when he can't fix it, he prays about it. What a blessing to be married to a pastor. 
You know, not only is he caring about other people, but girls, you are top on his list and he's praying for you. Just like Isaac's, his heart was toward, or with his, his wife, Rebecca, and they were together in this, but yet her heart was torn. So his heart's torn. I can make Gerald very sad. Do you know how that is? For me to be very sad. I can make Gerald very upset. Do you know how come that is? Then Gerald will become very upset. I can, I can navigate the room, and my husband will play off my moods just like he does yours. Because there comes a time where we shut the door of the church, and you are a normal family. And you go home, and you park your car, you turn off your keys, and you walk into your door, and now you're in the ministry. This part's easy. The hard part is living day in and day out. And being married to a pastor who's constantly on call and constantly caring about somebody other than you. But it's a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing that you are married to a man that will pray for you and can plead for you just like he did. And he prayed and Rebecca, his wife, conceived. And here we see she's, she's there. And it, they, they prayed about this for 20-something years because it says in verse 26, now Isaac is 60 years old and the baby's born. So you thought 40 was something. He's, he's a father for the first time at 60 all right, and so the Lord has been faithful to them. But as I was studying this and reading about it, I thought, how, I know Gerald blesses me and he prays for me, but how can I bless him? What is your role as women of God that are married to a pastor, that God designed you would be married to a pastor? What can you do? How can you refresh your husband? Your words will either hurt him or they will heal him. Because no one can speak to him the way that you can. Psalms 11.25 says, She who refreshes will also be refreshed. Proverbs 16.24 says, Pleasant words are healing to the bones. Gerald, I was talking to him, and I said, What do you want the women to know about spiritual warfare and how it works for a pastor? And he said, Tell them to always expect a Saturday night attack. Some of you pastor's wives are laughing at that because you know exactly what I'm saying. It happens. If it's going to happen, it's going to be Saturday night before they have to teach. But he said, always make sure that contention isn't coming from the wife. They can handle the outside attack. They can handle the, un the, the phone call that just came in in an untimely manner. They cannot handle contention from their wife and then to teach. He said, please let them know that. <laughs> So there you go, girls. That's from Pastor Gerald. Expect the Saturday night attack, right? Because we do serve a Lord, and we do have an enemy that wants to take him out, your husband, out of the ministry. Hundreds and hundreds of pastors, thousands of pastors quit being a pastor every year. And let us not be Job's wife that when he's having a bad day, you just look over and say, curse God and die. Sick of the whole thing. We want, to be, we want to be healing words to their hearts. We don't want them to wash out. We don't want them to quit the ministry. And some of you are going, want to bet? But you don't. You don't. They need godly men. The world needs godly men. And the world needs you. Pastor's wife, they look at you. They watch you. They see everything you do. They watch everything you say. They will tell you about it, too. They will let you know that they're watching you. I saw you. I did this. One day, Gerald and I, years ago, were walking. We were actually in Bullhead, Arizona, or somewhere like, or no, yeah, Bullhead or somewhere. But we came walking out of uh, Joanne's Fabric, and a lady comes walking up. You know, we're in California. We're in Arizona. She comes, Pastor Gerald! And I looked over at him, and I said, aren't you glad you don't smoke? Glad you weren't having a beer walking on in because no one's around us. They watch you constantly. And so here we have to be careful not to become Job's wife, curse God and die, because he was always loving God no matter what happened to him. And we need to be careful that we're not the Saturday night attack, that we're not antagonistic Saturday night, that we give them some time to be alone, that we let them go for a walk or we go for a walk. 
and let the house be quiet. I've been learning I need to let the house be quiet because Gerald, he's recovered and the Lord's healed him, but he still needs his naps in the afternoon because his brain's still healing. And so I've decided the best way he can have a nap is for me to leave. Maybe you need to leave maybe Saturday towards the evening and just say, I'll be back in a couple hours and let him have that quiet time with the Lord. Like I told you, I wanted to be a practical person talking to you, just not giving you lots of Bible verses, but talking to you about being a pastor's wife. Because I have been a pastor's wife over 45 years, married to somebody that was a pastor. Two different people. So I know a thing or two, because I've seen a thing or two. Let's see, how can we bless our husbands? Um, You're going to want to jot this down, because you're going to have a little assignment to do in just a second. I was reading a book, and it was talking about affirming your husband, telling him the good things with himself, and telling him how to encourage your husband. And you're going to want to write these down because you're going to forget, okay? The first one is, you need to be telling your husband he's one handsome man. Gosh, you're just hot. You're just cute. You're just one handsome man, okay? You need to affirm him he's a terrific kisser. Yeah. Yeah. Just think of that for a minute. He's a good kisser. He must have been because you married him. <laughs> you am happiest when, your arm, when I'm in your arms. It's my favorite place to be. Happiest when I'm in your arms. It's my favorite place to be. And then this one is, I'd go anywhere with you. And pastor's wife, I have to ask you, would you really? The one I fell in love with asked me to leave Twin Falls, Idaho, after living there 31 years, to a place called Yucca Valley. (laughs) Yeah, you laugh. I live there. And you know, um, I always tell that time when I speak, the tree, you know, the trees are Joshua trees. They're, you know, like tortured souls in the middle of the universe. (laughs) And I asked Gerald one time when we got to Yucca Valley, I, said, I have a couple of my Yucca Valley friends here. I said, I said, where are your trees? He goes, those are them. Those are not trees. I have seen trees, right? Those are not trees. Okay, no, they're, she's, agree, she's agreeing with me. They're not trees. Would you be willing right now, I want to ask you, if your husband, as you go home, says, I feel the Lord's calling me to Rhode Island to start a church. Or would you dig those heels in and go, my mom lives here. I'm not going anywhere. My best friend lives here. I'm not going anywhere. Will you really go where he wants to go and feels led of the Lord? I will tell you, I tried to talk Gerald into moving to Idaho. I just said, they probably got a lot of pastors down there. You have a big church. Let's just stay up here. They need you help up here. But you know what? That's not the way he saw it. One day I asked him, I said, out of all the places in Southern California that you could have lived when you came out here from Kansas and you were saying, I shall go there, why would you pick the desert? Out of all the places you could go. And you know what he said? I didn't pick it. I was assigned it. Are you willing to let your husband be assigned somewhere else someday? Now, what I want you to do is a little bit different, and I'm only going to give you a minute to do it, so get your phones out. Did she say that? Yes, she did. (laughs) Get your phones out, and I want you to tell your husband something along these lines. You are one handsome man. You are a terrific kisser. You are the first person I run to. And you're going to tell him, in your arms is my most favorite place to be. And then if you can say it and mean it, say, I'd go anywhere with you. And I will give you a minute. And you are just going to brighten his day. Just quickly text him something wonderful about himself.
Some of you are smiling. It's so cute. We got about 20, 30 more seconds. Then you're going to wrap it up with kissy emojis and all that kind of fun stuff. All of those things that you know what it means, and half of them I don't know. And then I send them to people, and they write back and go, What? What the what did you just send me? I don't know. I thought it was a smile. <laughs> and you're done. Send. And put your phone away. Here's some other letters of affirmation for your husband. Thank you for fixing that. Do you know, being a husband is a thankless job. They just are expected to keep up on everything. And, you know, every now and then you just, when they do something and they do it well, and all of a sudden you're going, that works and it didn't work, go, thank you. I always tell Gerald, thank you for fixing that. And he just, nope, no problem. (laughs) We need to say words like, you are my hero. But girls, don't wait till you're in the ICU and he's fighting for his life. I faced that. I went through that. And as I laid there not knowing if he was going to live, if it was fatal, or if he lived, if he would be all there mentally, physically, what I was going to end up with, I didn't know. Don't wait till the tubes are in his arms. And he can't look at light and his head's wrapped to tell him all these wonderful words. You are my hero. I love you. I love touching you. You know, rubbing his back to him is like magic. He just like turns like putty. He loves you. And somebody's touching him. He has to be careful all day long. He's a pastor. And he has to be very careful about what, how he appears and what he's doing and how he's embracing things and talking to somebody. Touch is very important in your marriage, and it's not too late to start today or tomorrow after this retreat. And wrap your arms around him and say, oh, I'm so glad I'm back to see you. Hold his hand and let other people see you holding his hand. Even if you have to be the aggressor and you're like, give me, give me that hand. Okay? And he's looking at you going, we haven't held hands in 40 years, woman. Just hold it anyway, okay? We're working on the love here, all right? Do you realize, ladies, that we need four hugs a day for survival to help depression and anxiety? Did you know that? That's what you need. That's how come so many people in your church will come up during a worship meet and greet to want to hug you. Especially look out for the widows and the single women of the church that will come up to the pastor's wife for a hug. I can tell you I have a line of women in my church that come up every Sunday morning for a hug. They need that. They need it. Four hugs a day for survival. Eight hugs a day for maintenance. Just living, being there, life is hard. Think of your children eight times a day. Make sure you're giving them a little hug, a little pat. But if you really want to grow your love for your children, and especially for your husband... It says 12 hugs a day for growth. Now, you know what that tells me? Not near as much hugging is going on that needs to be. Okay? Are you hugging your husband 12 times a day? That means walking in and out of the kitchen, give him a hug, and then in the morning, give him a hug, and then he walks back. That's pretty much hugging all day long. (laughs) That or you just wait till he gets home and you just go stand there. One, two. (laughs) Okay, but that's what they said. We don't hug And show affection near enough as women. Tell him words of affection like, you're smart. And ladies, focus on what he does well and not what he lacks. Okay? My husband has a great eye for landscaping amongst other things, but he just knows how to move that rock, do this, put that, plant that. He even has it down to don't plant that there because the sun doesn't hit that till 10 o'clock in the morning. Plant it over. He's got this all dialed in. People ask him to come over and help them landscape their backyard, their front yard. It's what he does well. He has has a vision. Compliment what he does well. What is he doing right now? You can just picture your husband at home. What does he do really well? And there's many things to think about. 
When's the last time you told him, I appreciate how you love me? I told Cheryl that just the other day. I said, you know what? I just love how you love me. You just love me so much. I just love that you love me that much. It's just affirming him. Do little things that get his attention. So Gerald travels a lot, all right? And we're going to be going back overseas and doing different things, starting up CBIs. So when I can't go with him, I stagger notes in his suitcase. Yes, I do. So I'll have like, I'll, I'll go in there when he's all packed, and then I'll go three pants down, note. Then I'll go over here by the socks, note. And I just stagger the whole suitcase full of little notes that every time I think maybe he's forgot me, there's a note, okay? Think of ways you can make him feel important. He's learned how to do that with me, and he's done it for 16 years since I've been married to him, and he leaves me a note every day at the coffee pot. I have stacks full of posty notes from Gerald Hagerman, how much he loves me, have a great day, praying for you today. It's just so, just, and it's just a sticky note. Just something small. When's the last time you told him, I trust your judgment and you're willing to let him be right? Just let him be right. We are like seriously active about having our own rights. I mean, look at our world right now. I mean, it's women everything. What about letting him just be right? Just give it to him. I said, that one you can have. I'm not going to fight you on that one. There you go. You're right. Don't forget to tell him he's your lover. Gerald said they only need to hear one word, and guess what that was? Yeah, you guessed it. <laughs> it's what they need. That's what they, because they can't get it from one other person. And I pity the fool that they get it from if it's somebody else and it's not me. <laughs> kind of crazy up in here. <laughs> Ladies, you let them know he's your lover. You're my lover. You're my sweetheart. This is very important in the ministry. I have your back. I got you. And don't let anyone talk bad about him to you. Do not listen to it. Walk away. Get up. Just got to go. You have his back. Gerald and I have a, um, a wooden platter in our kitchen that someone gave us for Christmas because Gerald always says, it's you and me, baby, against the world. Always have each other's back no matter what's swirling around your marriage and swirling around your kids and swirling around your neighborhood and swirling around your church. Always have each other's back. And that's on a plaque in our kitchen. It's so wonderful. It's you and me, baby, against the world. Remind him of that. Fight for the same cause he's fighting for. Do not be pulled apart. Join his cause. And don't fight against him. And remember to unplug your phone. So many, so sad. We've got to this point, and maybe you guys want to get into this too. And we'll go to a restaurant and we'll see people. It's the saddest thing: man and woman having dinner, and they're on their phone. And they're having dinner in a restaurant. He's looking at his, she's looking at hers, and they're just unplug your phone. And many of you need to leave it in another room. Just get away from it. Just get away and focus on what God gave you. Let's go back over here to Genesis. Those are just practical ways of telling your husband you love him. And it says here in verse 22, but it says here that the wife conceived, but the children struggled together within her, and she said, all isn't well. Why am I like this? So she went and inquired to the Lord. Okay, why are you like that? Why are, you, why are you quickly angered? Why are you going through that problem? Why are you like that? And take that to Jesus and say, why does that bother me so much? Why am I dealing with this? Why am I so quick-tempered? Why am I so negative? And take that to the Lord. She took what was going on in her tummy with her twins in her stomach, and she says, why is this hurting me so bad? And the Lord is going to speak to her about it. And so many times, you just need to take it to the Lord and talk to him about it. And when so many times, ladies, we wait so long to just come and bear our souls to God alone. We just wait 
Why do we wait so long? She said, and it says, and the Lord said to her, two nations will be in your womb. Two people will be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. And so here he's talking to her. She's seeking the Lord for this. Psalms 27, 8 says, when you said, seek my face, my heart said back to you, Lord, your face I will seek. He wants you to seek his face about what's going on up here in you and in your thought patterns and what you're dealing with and in your anxieties. She's seeking the Lord. Why is this happening? I think God can handle my questions really good. And I know that he can answer them. She's asking God to be part of everything she doesn't understand going on. And he is right there for her. Look at verse 24. It says, so when the days were fulfilled for her to give birth, and there were twins in her room. Now keep in mind, this is the same parents. They live in the same place. And they're going to raise them the same way. Uh, Maybe not. Look here, it says, and the first came out, and he was red. And he was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau, which means hairy. is that funny? So here she's got twins, and we're going to see God is going to be calling one of her twins, and the other one's going to be struggling, and even the one he calls is going to struggle terribly. Afterwards, his brother came out right after, took hold of him, Esau's heel, and they called him Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when the twins were born to him. And so here we see that now we've got one twin grabbing onto the other twin's you know, foot. So, of course, that means heel catcher. Jacob means heel catcher. catcher. It means schemer. And it means one that was going to have his way pretty much. How is it that you can have multiple children? Raise your hand if you have more than one child. Okay, so we're all on the same page. How, can it, how is that that you can have one, two children, four children, eight children, and every single one of them is different and they're raised the same way? Have you got it? One's easy and compliant. One's hard to raise. One is, you know, outgoing and friendly. The other one is sullen and sticks back. And here he's 60 years old when he's having these babies, And it says here in verse 27, they grew. Same birthday, same parents, same relatives, and they're living in the same home. The boys grew, and Esau was a skillful hunter and a man of the field. But Jacob was a mild man dwelling in the tents. Total different personalities going on, and they're twins. And the parents are going to feel drawn one to one and one to another which is never a good thing, and we're going to study about that. It says here, as the boys grew, Isaac loved, verse 28, Esau, because he ate the same game, and he liked hunting, and he was a man's man, and he was probably outgoing and pretty fun, but Rebecca loved Jacob. This is not good, because the house now has favorites. And when you have children, we can't have favorites. It's something that we have to fight against. If you only have one child, you're a saint. You don't even know. Seriously, do they know? How many of you just have one child? Oh, you're so blessed. I never want to hear anybody say, I'm not blessed, I have one child. Yes, you are so blessed. You have no idea the complications when you have more than one. It's a whole different game changer. Well, these two are going to end up fighting each other. And the parents are going to end up failing because they're going to pick a favorite. We have to be very careful in our home not to pick a favorite. My brother was my dad's world. They had Mike at 40-something. And then three years later, they had me. So my dad never dreamed he'd have a son ever in his life. And when he got that boy, that boy was his world. And then comes along a little sister, okay? And that was me. And my mom never dreamed she'd have a daughter. And especially 42 years old, back then it was a big deal. Now we have them like all the time. But back then that was unheard of. And so she, I became her tr- pride and joy. She had a daughter. But the two should never meet. 
Dad went off with him, and Mom went off with me. And that's how we lived. Once in a while, we got together for dinner, but I was my mom's girl, and Mike was my dad's son, and they were complete opposites. And this is how we lived. Now, I knew my dad loved me, but I wasn't his favorite. And Mike knew mom loved him, but he wasn't her favorite. Did you know that um, in the polls that are out there on the Internet and different places you can take, that the, they had um, interviewed adult children, and adult children said, 51% of them said they never felt equally treated by their mother with their sibling. And 49 said they felt more equal by the dad than the mother. That's not good. And why do we favor one child over another child? Well, because we have more in common with a lot of times one more child than the other child. I'm sure Esau, he loved it. He says, because he hated the game. I'm mean, Esau is going, he's a hunter. He's great at what he does. He's my man. He's, he's a hairy dude. He's got a beard. He's redheaded. I know all these things. I made them up in my mind. But I'm seriously thinking that he, that's how he looked, and he was stunt, and he was like, he was like out there. But now we got a mama's boy in the kitchen, and he likes to cook, and he likes to tell mama how pretty she is, and they get along so good, and they really enjoy being with one another but the favoritism is going to cause problems. When you have favoritism in your family with your children, it equals long-term danger for your kids. Years ago, now think back when I was a little girl, and that's an umpteen years ago I was a little girl, but what was really a treat for me and my brother were Doritos. Yeah, yeah, that was a big deal, okay? And we, I watched very carefully to make sure that we were always treated fairly. And that's what your kids are doing. They are going to see when you're favoring one and not the other, even when it comes to a bowl of Doritos. So my mom, my brother was extremely skinny, extremely, like, sickly skinny. He was very skinny. So one day I'm watching her in the kitchen. She didn't know I was there. And I snuck around the corner, and she had a big bowl, and she was filling it full. Then she had a little bowl, and she filled that full. And he got the big bowl. And I was so hurt. And I remember thinking, oh, I thought you were, I was your favorite. What are you doing? And she goes, he's very thin, Marilee, and you're fine. I'm, am I fat? Are you saying I'm fat? You can just imagine how that went from there on, right? We know that. That's what kids they immediately jump. And... Even today, after all these years, I'm talking to you about Doritos at a women's conference. <laughs> How pathetic is that? And, you know, even to this day, you can ask Gerald when we get hungry and we go out to a restaurant, I'd like to order three things. Because I'm not going to get enough. And Gerald goes, what happened in your childhood? <laughs> and, and he goes, and you're not a big woman. What happened to you that you think you need that one and that one and that one? And I just say, Doritos. It affected me my whole life. <laughs> Ladies, you're affecting your children for their whole life. And they are watching who you favor. And they're watching everything that you do. 51% of all adult children said, my mom favored one more than the other. Part of this is normal, but we need to learn how to correct it before our actions fall into a cycle of bad behavior. I wished I would have heard this sermon when I was raising my kids because it's just so much easier to get along sometimes with one kid than the other kid. And I really wished I would have had someone challenge me on that because I loved them personally, both equally. We do. We love them equally, don't we? But you're more compatible with one with another and you need to fight that because you're comfortable in it. And it's not healthy for that child. Not only is it not healthy for the child that is, you know, being favored, because what the, the child that's favored many times feels she can't meet up to your standard of the good star. So she gets resentment or he gets resentment because he is the good child, but then he is feeling the pressure not to ever let you down. And the other child that feels neglected 
are the ones with the inferior complex, are the ones with anxiety, are the ones that, you know, um, freak out and they don't, because they haven't had enough build up and the other ones had too much. And we need to fight this in our lives as being Christian moms to make sure that we're treating them both fairly. Um, Be fair in their allowances. Spending time with them equally, that's a really big one. For the one you're not that close to, you may have to make a date. You might just be really close to that one child, but the other one you're going to have to go, Friday night, you're mine, we're going to dinner, okay? And listen to them and seem interested in what they're talking to. But I don't like talking about that. It doesn't matter. Let them think you're interested in what they're telling you. Are they an artist? An art does not necessarily, you know, isn't something you really enjoy, and they're, yet they're an artist. Lean into the artist. Lean into what they're interested to and challenge yourself. Psalms 138 8 says, The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. The Lord will perfect that. He wants to work with us with our children. And the Bible is full of this. So let's read on and it says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of the game. Verse 28, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew and Esau came in from the field and he was weary. And Esau said to his brother, the heel catcher, the schemer, Please let feed me the same some of that red stew, for I'm weary. Therefore, his name was called Edom. So red stew, okay? And Edom ends up being the border of Israel, which is Jordan. And Esau looked and said, look, I'm about to die. What is my birthright? Oh, verse 31, Jacob, the heel catcher, said, sell me your birthright as in this day. And Esau said, look, I'm about to die. And what good is a birthright if I'm dead? So here we see impulsive, kind of the fun guy, been out hunting, living life for every second, doesn't think ahead of time, and he's just a total opposite of Jacob, the conniver, the schemer, and the one that always watches out for Jacob. He always watches out for Jacob, that he comes out ahead. And that's how many times it can be in our family. They're just two different kids. And Jacob said, swear to me this day. So he swore to him, and he sold his birthright to him. The rest of the story goes on, and it's a very sad story because um, he comes in, and and he tricks his dad, and he pretends he's Esau, and he has furs on, and we know the story. Your pastor's wives, you know how this goes. And, And he pretends to be Esau, and he gets Isaac's blessing, And the rest of the story is very, very sad because we see that she is going to go ahead and now Esau's mad and I'm summarizing it up and now Esau's so mad he gets the blessing that his brother actually did really sell his birthright to. Now he is so mad at him, he's going to come back and get him. He goes, I'll get you. And this, this terrible family feud starts. And so he goes, I'm going to kill him. I, I, I am going to deal with you, Jacob. And so long story short, mama puts him and says, go to my uncle. Go, go to your uncle and get out of here because your brother is after you. Rebecca was being unfair. She was plotting and she would do anything for one child. Told you, it's convicting. That one star child she loved, she would have done anything, even tricked her husband to stick up for his mistakes, to smooth it over and manipulate. She will do anything to protect one of her kids, but not two. Because she didn't correct it when she could have. She didn't hear this sermon. (laughs) She didn't have to sit and ponder and go, you know what, I I think I do. I think if we're honest, we probably all somewhat are more comfortable with one child than the other. Well, you can correct that. We don't have to go down that road and live a life like this, how it turns out to be. 
she was unfair and would have done anything, and she multiplied, or she was um, manipulating the situation, and it totally backfired on her because when she sent him away, her dearly beloved boy, Jacob, when she said, run from your brother, she'd never see him again. We can manipulate family problems to come out in our favor, but in the long run, it will backfire. In the long run, A will talk to B, B will talk to C, C will talk to D, it all comes back to you, and you're in trouble, and they're all mad at you, and there's something going on. We need to not be manipulators in our family, especially with our kids, picking one over the other. It's a very sad story. And Jacob gave Esau the bread, verse 34, and the stew of lentils, and he ate and drank and arose and went his day. Thus Esau despised his birthright. And that means his place in the family. Esau was probably so tired of being compared to Jacob because her mom, why aren't you soft and kind like your brother? Well, he's Esau, that he wasn't made that way. And so he despised being the first one born because there was a lot of responsibility on him. And the youngest one born didn't like being the youngest one because dad wouldn't even acknowledge him. He wasn't fair to the boys. She wasn't fair to the boys. And that we would never pick one child over another child. Our kids are important to the Lord, just how they are. And the Lord loves them. It says here, and I'm going to read it to you real quick, in Mark chapter 13, they brought a little children unto him that he could touch them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased, and he said to them, Let the little children come unto me. And do not forbid them, for such is the kingdom of God. Surely I say unto you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, they'll no more by any means enter the kingdom. And he took them up in his arms, and he laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. Jeremiah 1.5 says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I set you apart. God loves your kids equally. And even I can look back now and I can see some things that have tweaked me for my life and tweaked my brother for his life, but they did love us. And yet, it could have been maybe corrected. Matthew 18.10, Beware that you don't look down on any of these little ones, for I tell you that in heaven the angels are always in the presence of their heavenly Father, Samuel 3, 4, Samuel heard God's voice. Your kids can hear God's voice at a very young age. And the Lord called Samuel and spoke to him because he loved him. God loves that ornery child. (laughs) He does. And if you can get that one that's really trying for you, centered in the right direction, walking with Jesus, that girl or that boy can change the world. Praise God for the one that's harder for you to to be around and to to entrace and to make an appointment. Those are the ones that change the world. Psalms 127, verse 3, Children are inheritance from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. If you have a child in here and you have two children in here, four or five, whatever, that's your reward. Do you know how many people can't have a child? They never get to experience something in their tummy. They never get to experience a a hug from their very own body that the Lord allowed them to have a child with their husband. They're like arrows in the hand of a warrior, and so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man and the woman who has a quiver full. A lot of them. We need to just take this and look at it and say, what can I do? Well, ladies, I'll tell you what you can do. You can change. You can go home. And you can give that ornery one a great big old hug. 
than the one you just adore that's easy for you. Give them a hug. Make sure you count to five on both. One, two, three, four, five. Because you're not counting this one ten and then going over there and just patting this one on the shoulder. Okay? Because they irritate you because that's children and that's what they do. You're making an extra step to change. Because we don't want to have our kids grow up feeling inferior or have our kids grow up with anxiety or having the star child go, I'm tired of being good all the time. It's too much pressure you put on me. I can never live up to what you want me to be. We have to be so careful, and we have to be so careful to let the Lord convict us. I prayed and prayed about what to talk about. And I prayed that the Lord would maybe let you hear something you haven't maybe heard before. But now maybe you can help other friends of yours about this too. Maybe you can go and talk with your ladies at your church about not having a favorite child. I had a greeting card one time from my cousin, and I always walked with the Lord, and I'd loved the Lord since I was a little girl, and she'd gone through some big problems, and she sent me a card, and it said, we're all God's children. And then you opened it up, and it said, but he loved you the best. And I was so sad because that's what she thought. So let's be the vessel that pours love. Let's be the vessel that's fair in the home. Let's do the same allowances, the same Doritos. Let's do all those little things so their little eyes aren't watching and comparing who you love more and who's more important to you. Together, Gerald and I have 17 grandchildren. That's a lot of kids. And so according to all the kids also that we have, the adult children, so basically what we do all the time is we just write checks. <laughs> Sometimes two or three a month. Because we remember them all. And so we are wanting to be fair. Not one is more you know, loved than the other. And just yesterday, I was at the restaurant, and I had both. I had five of the grandchildren there, and the middle one, who's seven years old, she goes, "But who's your favorite?" And I tell them they're all my favorite. They don't know I'm telling them that, but I tell every single one of them, "You're my favorite." And then I see that one come in, I go, "You're my favorite." And someday when I'm dead, they'll all compare notes because <laughs> they all think. That I was that they were my favorite. But see, God's like that. He He loves you all the same, and He loves your children all the same. And He wants you to raise them to know Him. And especially when they start being 11, 12, 14, it's hard. So just make sure you're fair. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, God for this time where we can just have a different study about how to be practical and love our husbands. Lord, and how we can change and be better parents, Father, by not comparing one to the other, Lord Jesus, but letting them shine in their own light, Father, and encouraging them to love you and shine for you. And so, Father, we praise you, Lord, that you're constantly perfecting what's going on inside our heart. You're constantly perfecting what's happening with us, Lord. And Father, I thank you for that. I thank you that, that it's never just arrived and we're there, but that it's a continuation, Lord, of helping us. And Father, we need wisdom to be a good wife. And Lord, we need wisdom to be a good mom. And so, Father, would you change us from within? Would you just take that and change us? In Jesus' name. Amen. I've got a few minutes, and they asked me if I would open up for questions. So I've got about 10, 15 minutes, and we can open up. Does anyone have a question or a comment that they want to share? Yes. Go ahead and stand up. Okay. Okay. 
Yes. Well, I will tell you, my husband was pastoring Joshua Springs for almost 40 years. And so um, he's 69. And last year is when he uh, turned the church over to B.J. Huther, whose wife is going to be here tomorrow. And so that's an adjusting time, okay, when, when they're taking on a different role. But, you know, I think the more you keep pouring into their heart and telling them how much you love them, and how special they are. And the, you can never underestimate a big hug and telling them you're praying for them. And at night, all the time, every night, before I go to bed, he'll be asleep before I am, and I go and I lay my hands on him and I pray for him. Pray for your husband. He's going through a hard time. His identity has been ministry. And so um, there's lo- I'll talk to you afterwards about some other I- things that I can talk to you about on a more private level, but different ways they can serve also as they get older. Uh, we happen to have a Bible college that's uh, Calvary Bible Institute that's out at our church, and that's around the world now, and they're just begging for pastors to come and teach around the world. And if anybody's going through that and their husbands are looking for a second, what does the second part of my life look like? And you're all pastors' wives. Uh, we have lots of opportunities for them to go into the world and help us raise up these kids. Uh, we just opened up Japan and Brazil And then he called me this morning. He said, I just got off the phone. We're going to open one in Uganda and Malawi. And we need people in the mission field willing to go out and teach these kids and come on short-term missions. So just I'll talk with you, and I'll give you the number. And Yes. Well, if you have a husband that's near retirement age, why don't you just stand? Anybody else here as far as husband's thinking about, oh, I've kind of been a pastor for 40 years. <laughs> I might be doing something. Let's just, ladies, let's just pray for them, okay? Heavenly Father, you know these dear servants, the men that they represent here that have served you and served you and served you. And Lord Jesus, I ask you that they would be that beacon of light and happiness in the family, Lord Jesus, that they would be um, encouraging whatever their husbands are wanting to do, Father. Lord, I pray you give them wisdom. Because, Lord, we know that Rebecca went and inquired of you and said, why is this happening? Why is this feeling strange? And you answered her because there were two nations in her stomach, and and you reasoned with her. And, Lord, would you help these dear, sweet, seasoned ladies that have served you a long time in the new embankment of doing something different and encouraging their husbands and saying the right words at the right time. In Jesus' name, we all said Amen. Is there someone else that has a question about a kid or a yes? Oh, you need prayer. <laughs> Okay, I I have a wonderful, beautiful friend of mine sitting on the front row, and her name is Clarissa, and she's also got two children, and she's the pastor's wife, and she's the worship leader. So I'd like you to connect with her, Clarissa, if you'll do that afterwards, because she can minister to you, and and that's a lot. Ministry is full-time. That's why when my first husband passed away and he had cancer, and I went before the Lord and I said, I don't think I'll ever get married again, but if I do... Could could it be a rich businessman? Because I I paid my dues. I was married 31 years to a pastor. Can I I just have someone thinks about me? Just me. 
And you know, the Lord laughed, and I know he did, and shook his head, and he said, no. What are you going to do with a seasoned pastor's wife? You're going to give her to another pastor. And I've had the most wonderful 16 years with Gerald. It's been wonderful. So, okay, so I'm connecting you two. Anybody else? I'm a connector. That's what I do. You ask me what I do, I connect. Anybody else got something else going on? We all okay? Yes. You know, they're hard. I had one, and then I had one that was easy to raise, and I had a strong one. I had one that I'd tell come in at 11 o'clock at night, and she'd come in at 1130. And then I had one that I'd say come in at 11 o'clock at night, and he'd come home at 10. They're hard, but you have to look for good because that's the one that will change the world. Okay? And it's easy to let us get frustrated with them. I, I gave my granddaughter, um, she had a habit of lying, And so I heard from somebody else that they had Ten Commandments in their bathroom, and so they put it in their bathroom. And so so when the kids are sitting there, they're reading, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And they have no choice, right? It's just like, that's what you got to read because you're right there. So I went and I got my little granddaughter this Ten Commandments, and I, and I took it over to her, and I, I said, you need to just put this somewhere where you read it. Well, her mama said, okay, and she can, she's seven. So she put it right under her window, and she has one of those windows that goes down to the ground. And so she sat it right on the window, so every time she got up in the morning or pulled her, her curtains back, she would read the Ten Commandments, or she'd see the Ten Commandments. And then one day, Audrey called me, and she said, you're not going to believe what your granddaughter did. And I said, what did she do? And she goes, well, we're coming home from the store the other night. And now all of a sudden she's turned the words thou shalt not are facing the parking lot. And what's inside her bedroom is just a plain poster. And she said, you know, because it's just the back of the picture. So the words are outside, right? And her in her room, it's just nothing. It's just a plain, you know, back of... And so she goes, I asked her, why did you turn around your present that Grandma bought you? And why is it facing the parking lot out where people pull in? Well, they need a lot more out there than I do in here. (laughs) Strong-willed child. They're the ones that are going to change the world. Pray for patience. Pray that the Lord will give you the right words to say. Pray that you'll be able to understand them. And pray that you'll want to be around them. So, Lord, give me an extra dose of love for this one. Because, you know, she's tired of being in her room. <laughs> and, you know, once in a while, you know, you got to... I had a, a, a dear aunt, and she told her daughter, you can go out, but you make sure you clean everything in this whole house before you go. And the girl was like 16 years old. Well, the mom came home at 8 o'clock at night, and the girl was getting ready to go out. And she looked at the kitchen. It was beautiful. And she looked at her, the bedrooms. It was beautiful. And she looked at the bathrooms, and they were spotless. And then she went into her room. The mom went into her husband's room and her room, and it was a mess. And so she called her in. She goes, you can't go out tonight. You didn't do my room. You know, just be nice, moms. It broke her heart. And I remember leaving that day thinking, I'm glad that wasn't my mom. Because my mom would have focused on all the things I did good. She would have said, you cleaned this, and you went through the dishwasher. and you... But, you know, the mom's expectations were so high for this one girl. She was just so sad afterwards. So just put them where they're at. She's not, she's probably Esau. She's not Jacob. (laughs) She's the outgoing one. The hard ones are the outgoing ones, but they are a blessing from the Lord. Is somebody else who has another hand? Yes. You know, when I was young, I had severe skin problems as a little girl, and I've had them my whole life. And sometimes when I would when I would go to school, second, third grade, I would just itch everywhere. I I just itch. Okay, 
And so my mom would go to parent teachers conference and she'd come back out again and she'd I'd say, How did it go? And she said, You did great. And then I would read maybe once in a while and it said, This not attentive or this not attentive. Because the teacher didn't know that I was on anti itch drugs. Do you know what I mean? And so we can never like be and once in a while they're rebellious and they're four, that's different. But if it's a small child, don't let them listen to negative. Do you know? You just tell the teacher, I'll take care of it at home. We'll work a little harder. But you don't say, your teacher says you're not doing good, and you better knock it off, and you're not studying hard enough, and I'm not putting up with all that. And You, you know, moms, I'm older now, and I'm smarter. I know a thing or two because I've seen a thing or two. I've had two families now, two pastor husbands. And err on the side of kindness. Okay? If we're going to err, Pastor Chuck always said, err on the side of kindness. And that's what I think we need to be a little bit more of. Sometimes moms, as Christians, moms, we're so strict, and you're going to be raised a Christian, and you're going to do this. And once in a while, just err on the side of kindness. They don't need to hear the negative people say about them. Nothing's harder than a pastor's kid because everyone watches them. So you pray extra, and you protect them. That's what, because you're the mama. Anybody else? Let's pray. Oh, one more, then we'll stop. Okay. Can you stand and talk? We can hear you a little bit better. So are you the pastor's wife? Say it. All you have to do is go, let's just pray for that one right now. All you have to do is right there when they're talking about it and you're there, just say, let's just stop and pray for her right now. Yes, yeah. It's kind of like the leverage the mom wishes she had so she can tell, she can tell well, you know, my, years ago, what my parents would do when we were fighting or we were having problems, they would make us all get in a circle to pray together because they would determine we were going to be godly, okay? And we all got there and we told on each other. <laughs> my brother would say, yeah, I can't believe you gave me that for a sister. <laughs> and then I'd go, I can't stand him. I just, I mean, when my mother would go, God, why did you give me these two? And my dad would go, oh, God, please help me. And it was over. We all went to our rooms. So the best thing for them, they're talking about them. If the child's standing there and you have it within your realm to be able to do this, I just say, can I pray for you right now, Sally? Can I pray for you? You're having a hard time. She will always remember that. She will always remember, instead of agreeing and saying, how dare her, she will always agree. She, as a pastor's wife, she will always look kindly upon a pastor's wife. A pastor's wife cannot be too nurturing to children in her church. You just can't be. You just, they're looking at you and you want them to come away. We don't want a church that's white carpet and it's like, you know, pristine and, you know, it's quiet. That's a dead church. We want fingerprints. We want kids in the bathroom that have plugged the toilet. We want... We want to paint, repaint the wall because someone was bored and scribbling. We want the kids in church. And if you have a chance, if the mama's venting to you, and maybe you're on the phone, just say, can we just stop and pray for her right now? Let's just pray for your little girl, your little boy. Let's just pray. And it points them back to the kindness of God, right? And so then the mom calms down. Lots of times they just need to know they're not the only one in the battle, do you know? And so they'll turn to the pastor's wife. Just always make sure you end it in prayer after you're done talking and listening to her. Say, can we just pray right now? Can I pray for you that you'll have more patience with her or you'll understand her heart or why she did that? Why did she turn the poster around? Because more people out there need Jesus because she already has him. <laughs> Go the extra mile to try to figure out why they act the way they do. And in closing... We lived on a cul-de-sac when I was raising our kids, and uh, my son had a best friend that lived up the block, and he'd drive his bike all the way down, and he would come around and circle the corner, and he'd go, BJ! And he'd go back up the hill, then he'd come back down, and he'd go, BJ! And we would listen to this probably 15 times. 
okay? And it happened every day. So one day, my husband was underneath the car, working on the car, because that's what you do when you're a pastor and you don't have a lot of money and you can't take it in and you got to figure it out, and then you teach on Sunday, right? So as this kid's coming down, the, my husband's underneath the car, and he said, I listened for about four or five times, and he goes, BJ, BJ, and he goes, I got up. And he goes, I walked over to the end of the cul-de-sac there in Idaho. I waited for him to come around again. I stopped his bike. And I said, I want you to go and get off your bike and go ring the doorbell and ask for BJ and stop calling him out 15, 20 times a day. He goes, I'm working on my car. I, you need to go. The little kid gets off his bike and puts his kickstand up. Goes and rings the doorbell. Can BJ play? No, not right now. Maybe about half an hour. Okay. Walks back out. Brings underneath the car again. He goes, hey, mister. Yes. Could you help me get back on my bike? <laughs> Sometimes the squeaky kid, there's a reason they're acting that way. There's a, he couldn't get back up on his bike. So he had to just go in circles to scream. <laughs> He couldn't reach. And Brent goes, yeah, let me help you. And got him, put him back on his bike. And until the kid got big enough to get back on his bike on his own, that's how we lived. BJ! <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for these dear women that love you. They adore you. Jesus, we want to be used of you in our family. We want to be used of you with our husband to be that encouragement, that cheerleader. We want our children to know you. Teach us how to teach them. Show us how to love them and change us. In Jesus' name, we all said amen. God bless you, ladies. Thanks for having me.